Paleo Runner Podcast is devoted to finding better ways to live, run, train, and eat. I'm your host, Aaron Olson. You can find more information by going to paleorunner.org. If you enjoy the show, please go to iTunes and leave a review. Search for Paleo Runner in iTunes and click Ratings and Reviews. You can also follow me on Facebook.com slash RunPaleo or on Twitter at RunPaleo. I wanted to take a minute to let you know about a product I've been using called 3Fuel. 3Fuel is a sports drink that gives you fat, protein, and carbohydrates to use as a fuel source. Unlike sugar sports drinks, 3Fuel gets absorbed slowly into your bloodstream to give you sustained energy throughout your workout. If you'd like to give it a try, you can get 10% off by using the coupon code 3F Olson. Go to paleorunner.org and click 3Fuel at the top of the page. If you're listening through the podcast app on iPhone, click the link displayed on the app right now. My guest today is Marlene Zook. Marlene is an American evolutionary biologist and behavioral ecologist. She is author of Paleo Fantasy, What Evolution Really Tells Us About Sex, Diet, and How We Live, and How to Live. Marlene, thanks so much for being part of the show. Thanks for having me. So, Marlene, tell me a little about, bit about your background as a scientist. How did you get interested in evolution, evolutionary biology, I should say? Well, I, I do most of my research on animal behavior and how it evolves, um, a lot of it with reproductive behavior and sex, and I am interested in how the general public looks at animal behavior and talks about it. We often do that in an evolutionary context, and I wanted, and so for this particular book, I've, I've written a few others looking at evolution from other perspectives, but for this particular book, I wanted to explore the idea of how we look at our current behavior based on the way we think our past was. So all over the place when you hear people reflecting on modern life and what it's done to us and whether it's good for us or bad for us, you hear them say, well, you know, we weren't meant to do this because originally we were, and then you can fill in the blank, you know, we were living in small groups, we were not uh, raising crops, we were, um, you know, moving a lot more, we were eating different things, we, you know, and so on and so forth. And so because I'm interested in evolution, I, you know, was interested in that. And then from a completely separate perspective, a lot of the research that I have been doing in my own lab over the last um, uh, several years has involved extremely rapid evolution. So evolution that happens in, well, the classic definition is within fewer than 100 generations, which scientists are finding is way more common than they thought than they had thought before. And in my case, less than 20 generations, we saw this real marked evolutionary shift in the crickets that I study in Hawaii. Um, and so that got me into doing a lot of reading in how rapidly evolution can occur and what that means. And then finally, so this is yet another sort of overlapping way that I got interested in, in writing the book. There's so much amazing information that we have now because of the new tools of genomics and the way that we can examine differences in genes across populations and um, in you know people in different parts of the world. And we can do that in humans in a way that's completely unprecedented. I mean, we just never used to be able to study our own genomes like this. And so a lot of the, the exciting stuff that was coming out was stuff that I wanted to share, and so that was another big motivating factor for, for writing the book. And also just so, so to give um, people who are listening a little bit more background, so I'm, I'm a professor in the Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Behavior at the University of Minnesota, um, and so I don't work on humans per se, um, but a lot of the stuff that I got interested in had to do with human evolution, and so I ended up getting to talk to a lot of my anthropologist colleagues and archaeologists archaeologist colleagues and so forth. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we were talking a little bit before we started recording about how, you know, you're not necessarily specifically interested in dispelling the paleo diet per se, but more just uh, how people look at the role of evolution and, and uh, how we can use that to either help our lives or, or um, just use evolution in general as a template. And uh, one of the things I found in your book was that you really focused on the speed of evolution and that that, that is more important than how long a particular species spends in a, in a particular period of time, but looking at how fast can something evolve. Do you have any examples of rapid evolution that you could share with the audience? Sure. Uh, and indeed, as I said, one of the really striking things about the recent discoveries is that we're only now coming to appreciate how rapidly evolution can happen and how it can happen in ways that are detectable if you look at the genome, but they might not be detectable if you just, you know, looked at the way, you know, a person appears. 
And so, you know, we have this image of evolution being something, well, it takes millions of years and a- adaptation is always extremely slow. And, you know, so if you look at someone now, they don't superficially look any different than the way someone from several thousand years ago would look. And so, you know, how can we have changed that much? But in fact, we have changed in some ways and not in others. And so to me, it's a much more interesting question to say, well, why do some traits change quickly and some traits change slowly than to focus on this idea that, oh, we've got sort of old genes in, you know, the, a modern body um, or something like that. So that's kind of a little bit of background. But for an example, the, the one that I like to use in terms of rapid evolution in people is uh, the evolution of lactase persistence or our ability to digest dairy products. Because that's the first thing that a lot of people will argue that, you know, well, it's not natural for humans to be consuming milk and other dairy products um, because as mammals, and this part's certainly true, uh, you know, all mammals, including many populations, of humans lose the ability we all drink milk when we're young and that's what makes us mammals but we lose that ability to digest lactose which is the sugar in milk uh, because we lose the enzyme called lactase necessary for breaking lactose down and we lose that around the time of weaning so you know adults can no longer uh, adult you know most adult uh, mammals can no longer digest uh, dairy products except in you know extremely uh, tiny amounts so it does seem reasonable to say, well, so therefore, you know, it's, it's only been, you know, a few thousand years since um, uh, people started, you know, using dairy. So therefore, it must be unnatural for us. But it turns out that, in fact, the genes necessary for lactase persistence, for having that enzyme hang around in the body after weaning, have changed. And they've, they're different in different populations. And the way we think it happens is through this, this really interesting uh, process called gene culture coevolution. So imagine that there was a population of people five to seven thousand years ago. Uh, they were living maybe in some part in Africa, maybe in northern Europe, and they were herding cattle or similar animals. And they weren't doing it for dairy because people weren't using consuming dairy at that time. They were doing it for meat and for the hides that the animals produced because those are also useful products. Okay, then let's imagine that just because populations are variable and genes are variable and we all differ from each other, there were some people in that population that happened to bear a gene variant that enabled them to digest milk after, you know, for a long period after weaning. Well, those people would be at an advantage because they had a food source that other people in the population lacked. And some scientists have suggested they also had a source of uncontaminated fluid because it's possible that water that wasn't polluted by disease organisms or, you know, other uh, toxins, you know, might have been in short supply. So those people with the gene variant were at an advantage. They therefore were more likely to survive and have kids who also bore the gene variant. And so you had an increase in those people. But then that also selected for more cattle herding because herding cattle became even more advantageous. And then the more people herded cattle, the more important it was to have the gene that allowed you to digest the dairy products. And so you get this really interesting feedback between the genes and the cultural practice of cattle herding. And the end result is that today um, we have a fair proportion of people on Earth who carry a gene that's different from what people 5,000 or 7,000 years ago would have carried and that enables them to digest dairy. So we've evolved. Mm-hmm. And 5,000 years is a super short period of time, um, you know, in an evolutionary perspective. Right. So this isn't to say that everybody bears the gene. We all know people who are lactose intolerant. And so all that means is that your ancestors probably didn't come from a place where where herding cattle was a you know big cultural practice mm-hmm. but you know so 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 there's been all these changes that have happened and it's not like you know we evolved to a certain point and I, and I think this was really the the myth that I wanted to get to in the book is that it's not like people evolved to a certain point at some period in the past like whether that's 10,000 years ago pre-agriculture or 100,000 years ago or a million years ago or any other time you want to pick and then, okay, phew, we've got the bipedalism thing, we've got the big brains, we're now like, you know, living in these little social groups. All right, we're, we're done now. We're kind of, we're, we're homo sapiens and now we can stop and go on to, and that's, that's just not how evolution works, you know, and, and I think that consciously people understand that's not how it works, but then the way we talk often, it's like, oh no, we evolved to this particular point and now we're done. Okay. And, you know, we're not done. That's, that's just not how evolution happens. So I recently had a conversation that I'll be releasing on a podcast with uh, John Durant, and 
he he uses this analogy of the zoo where he he tells about these apes that were in a zoo that were getting very sick and they were having high triglycerides and a lot of the factors that go into heart disease and then they were displaying some weird behaviors like pulling out their hair and eating their own feces and what the zoo did was have them eat a more instead of feeding them these gorilla biscuits they fed them a more natural diet that was more suited to their environment and he uses that analogy to say well as humans we need to look at what our natural environment is if we really want to thrive what do you say to that perspective I mean, there's certainly, you know, some truth to it that you, you can't just with impunity, you know, your your body is suited to eating a certain diet or, you know, your body is suited to, you know, lots of other things. And you can't just suddenly do all kinds of stuff to it and expect it to, to not react. But part of the problem there is figuring out what exactly a natural diet for humans is. And second, you know, trying to figure out what you would do that would approximate that either more or less closely. So for humans, I think, you know, pretty much everybody would say that having a lot of nutritionally poor but calorie dense food available all the time, which is the situation for a lot of people in Western industrialized societies, is not good for your body. And I think that's one of the contributors to the current epidemic of obesity and the increase in uh, hypertension and diabetes and so forth. And I, I think a lot of people, you know, that's not a particularly controversial thing to think. But if you move on from there and you say, okay, um, you know, so then what would be a better way for us to eat? I think you can figure that out from our physiology rather than saying we should try to figure out what people were eating at a particular point in time. And I'm not saying that's what he was arguing, mm -hmm. but but that, that okay, um, absolutely, you know, like no one's, saying, you know, just because evolution happens rapidly and lactase persistence evolved within 5,000 years doesn't mean that you can now throw caution in the winds and live on, you know, Cheetos and Diet Coke for the rest of your life. I mean, you know, we all know that's not going to, you know, that's not going to happen. And rapid evolution isn't going to get you out of that either. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, so what would be, I mean, one of the interesting things about human diets is how variable they've been for a really, really long time. So our ancestors, even, you know, many thousands of years ago, were eating lots of different things depending depending on what part of the world they were living in. Humans are remarkably adaptable to lots of different kinds of food sources. And, you know, yes, like I said, you can make some basic rules like, you know, lots and lots of extremely processed foods that don't have a lot of nutrients in them are bad for you, and we need certain amounts of vitamins, and, you know, we um, doubtless evolved eating lots more fiber than most uh, Western industrial, you know, diets contain in them. But beyond a lot of, you know, fairly broad principles, it gets really tricky trying to figure out the details. Um, and then the other point with that is that if you wanted to talk about, so so the, the diet that gorillas eat in the wild is still available. The diet that humans would have been eating, regardless of what part of the world you're talking about, 10 or 20 or 100,000 years ago, is gone. I mean, you, you know, I suppose you could try to find some, you know, think, think about our the um, the plant products that we consume now. All of the the plant products, including all of the fruits and vegetables. So, so leaving aside, you know, if you want to demonize, you know, corn or wheat or whatever, mm -hmm. but but leaving that aside, all of the fruits and vegetables that we now consume are incredibly modified from their ancestors. The ancestors of apples are these nasty little bitter things that you know you probably. I mean, it's amazing that people thought, oh, yeah, I want to, you know, start with that and make something that's going to be tasty. Um, I, you know, I, I think the, the more remarkable thing when you look at ancestral foods is not, wow, that would be good for me, but why did anyone ever think that would be tasty? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I think that your perspective is a little bit maybe what you're saying, at least what I got from the book, is that not necessarily that the paleo diet is bad, but you need a more um, sophisticated perspective. One of the quotes you have that I got from the book was that we can look at the past, but we need to do it in a much more limited way. Is that? Well, yeah, and I, you know, that I guess that, that's what I'm that? saying. That yeah, that that you can't just say, you know, okay, I'm going to find an ancestral this or an ancestral that. Um, and and also, I think buried in this idea that the ancestral way is better is this assumption that I referred to earlier that evolution has been sort of going toward this particular goal so that we're perfectly in harmony with our environment. And and whether you think that happened 10,000 years ago or you know 100,000 years ago or whatever. That also is kind of a misunderstanding of the way evolution works because it's not like everybody's kind of chunking along until they get to this point where everything is perfect in the environment. 
evolution is constantly, it, it's composed of tons of trade-offs and compromises and things that work okay under some circumstances but not under others. And, and so, oh, we've got this ideal of people or any other organism that's living in their environment and is perfectly adapted to it is... It's just not really, you know, everything has parasites, and so you're constantly having these trade-offs between defending yourself against pathogens, but then also those are resources that could be used for other things in your life. And, you know, biology is complicated. Right. I mean, you know, I, I'm not trying to make light of it, but, but it really is a difficult thing to grab a hold of. I mean, one of the examples that lots of people have heard of, of course, is um, like sickle cell anemia, right? So I assume that, you know, lots of people know that um, for some people in Africa, if, uh, or who's ancestors are from Africa, if they're from an area where malaria was prevalent. Oh, Marlene? Um, yeah? I, I lost you for about 10 seconds. You, you were, the last thing I heard you say, if you were in Africa and there oh, was a place okay. where um, malaria was, was prevalent, I think you were going to go on to say that you would, you would evolve a certain genetic trait to combat that? Yeah, so, so, um, so I, I don't know if everybody's heard of sickle cell anemia, um, which is a disease that um, is more, more common in people with African ancestry. Um, and uh, the, it's caused by the presence of um, a gene that if it occurs in a single copy, if so everybody has, you know, you have two copies of all of your genes. And the sickle cell gene, if you have just one copy, then it turns out you're resistant to malaria. Malaria, because your genes are dealing with the way that malaria, the malaria parasite affects your red blood cells more effectively than people who don't have that gene. So you're at an advantage. If you have two copies of the gene, though, you have this terrible illness and people with two copies of the gene until modern medicine died at a very young age. So, okay, were we better adapted in populations with the sickle cell gene? Well, yeah, if there's malaria, because the cost of dying of malaria is greater than the cost of having some of your kids have two copies of the gene and hence die from the sickle cell disease. But in a perfect world, you wouldn't have malaria or the sickle cell gene because there's some costs and some benefits to it. And so I think that just that one small example points to how, so were we in a more natural state when we had sickle cell present in, a, in the population? Sure. We were also in a more natural state with malaria. So, what you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's just too hard to try to, to reconstruct this because everything has costs and benefits and things that are advantageous under some circumstances and not advantageous under others. And, you know, another example, to think about with this is well, what about being bipedal? Isn't you know bipedal? Being bipedal is really terrible for us in some ways. You know, it it creates a big strain on your back. A lot of the we get musculoskeletal problems that are associated with not walking on four legs. Earth is difficult because the you know the structure of the pelvic girdle is it constrains um, you know women's ability to give birth and so forth. But you know nobody's saying God you know evolution just went so terribly wrong when we came down out of the trees because or when you know we stopped being uh, you know quadrupedal because you know it's like honey that ship has sailed right <laughs> I you know it's it and that's just how evolution works like sure it, you could argue that it would have been better in some sense at least for our skeletal systems if we hadn't become bipedal but that just really seems kind of like a specious argument to me you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, let's talk a little bit about exercise. You, you devote a chapter in the book to exercise, and you talk a little bit about um, people like Art Devaney who advocate short, intense bursts of exercise and how that might not necessarily be as good as he claims it is. But uh, what can you tell me about that? I mean, Art Devaney is like 70 years old, and he's in phenomenal shape. Uh, what, what do you say about those types of exercise programs? Well, you know, again, it points to, as with it, that human beings are really variable, and we you don't all have to, I mean, you know, more power to him, but also, you know, lots of people that don't exercise like him that are his age that are in good shape, too. So it's clear that, you know, you don't have to do things in a particular way. And the, the exercise thing was interesting. I didn't know anything about the, the whole barefoot running and the sprints versus marathon stuff before I started doing the research for the book. And so I was kind of a blank slate for that. And I was really interested to look at some of the data on human adaptations for long distance running. And I'm not a runner either. So I was fascinated to see that if you compare our skeletons to the skeletons of um, either our uh, current, you know, contemporary, uh, you know, primate relatives like chimpanzees, or if you look at fossil human skeletons, modern humans seem like they've got all these adaptations that are associated not with w just walking upright, but with running. So, you know, there's ways that our heads are cushioned for the rapid back and forth movement of running and, um, you know, the way your head's connected to your neck and some other things, you know, some other aspects about the way your hip joint works and so forth. And 
So if you look at kind of skeletal signatures, it sure looks like people were running. And then if you think about how this might have functioned, as I'm sure you know, um, there's a really interesting hypothesis from some anthropologists looking at uh, the potential for endurance running and long distance running functioning in our past as a way to run down prey. Because humans, with our, our lack of hair, can and, and our ability to sweat can endure overheating much more readily than most of the mammalian prey we would have been hunting. And so the idea here, and I, th- I, I personally think the evidence is pretty good, the idea is that people would have been running down um, large mammals because you can't outrun something like a gazelle in a sprint. It's just not going to happen. Yeah. But what you can do is keep after it, keep after it, keep after it, prevent it from resting. And so in a hot environment, they eventually just overheat, keel over and you can you know run up and stab them with your spear or what have you. Right. Uh, and and so the evidence for that I think is is pretty interesting. But you know I guess like I said that all all of the data that I see suggests that humans were pretty variable in a lot of aspects of their biology, including diet and movement. Which again is not to say either that you can spend all your time eating you know junk food or that being sedentary isn't bad for you because we've got lots of evidence suggesting that it is. Mm-hmm. That it's not just that what your exercise program is for the you know hour you spend you know actually in the gym or wherever it is you're going to be exercising it's that human beings don't have bodies that are very well suited for lots of sitting right right uh, yeah you know that that's one thing that I found uh, helpful when I'm out running and uh, and doing exercises people ask me why do you do these long distance runs and and I think to myself you know this is kind of how I'm born this is what I'm made for is there is there anything wrong with someone who who has this fantasy about how our ancestors exercised and if it motivates them to get out there do you see anything wrong with that no you know again I just you know I just think it you know if you want to think about the way evolution acted on people or acted on anything else I think you you need to get away from, like I said, this idea that there was this perfect way to do things and, you know, any deviation from that, you're going to get in terrible trouble, mm-hmm. um, you know, because I think we do have a tendency to romanticize the past, whether that's, you know, our own childhoods or the 1950s or pre-industrialized civilization or pre-agricultural civilization or, you know, what have you. Mm-hmm. So, you know, Marlene, uh, one of the things that I ask a lot of the people who come on the show is what is it that you actually eat on a daily basis and what kind of exercise do you do? And sometimes it's fun to hear what the what the guest actually does because they might prescribe something or, or talk about some, something in a certain way. But when you actually hear what they do, it's 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 just kind of fun to hear. So <laughs> what, what what kind of diet do you follow and do you do any exercise? Um, I don't follow a particular, you know, like I don't follow anything particularly strict. I, I, I did I, one of the the uh, the reviews uh, of the book on, I guess it was on, I think it was Amazon um, fairly early on, was that this was a book designed for vegan feminists, which I thought was kind of an interesting statement. Um, I mean, I, I certainly, I, I guess I consider myself a feminist. I'm not vegan. Uh-huh. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'm not sure what, you know, where, where they were you know going with that. Um, and yeah, I like to get a lot of exercise. I always think of myself as being kind of a twitchy person. Um, and so, you know, sure, I, I, you know, I walk a lot. I bike. I, um, I'm, like I said, I'm not a runner. Um, but, you know, I like, I like doing a, a lot of exercise. One of the interesting things I read, um, again, for the exercise chapter is that there seems to be a difference in people and their genetic predisposition to, um, just kind of move in very small ways during the day. So it's non-exercise. Now I can't remember the, um, the acronym. Um, I'd have to look at the book, but, it's uh, like non-exercise activity, something, something. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, there's a scientist who points out that people seem to differ genetically in just, you know, how kind of fidgety a person you are. And being more fidgety is associated with less of a tendency to be overweight. Um, and so it seems like we kind of burn calories in a small way, um, or at least we can, uh, throughout throughout the day. So it's interesting to, to think about our physiology, again, not in the sense of, you know, what were people doing 10,000 years ago, but what do we seem to have tendencies to doing and how how variable are those tendencies? Um, so, you know, there's there's a lot of interesting stuff, I think, that's that's now coming out. Something I didn't spend a lot of time on in the book, but I think is, is getting increasingly popular, is uh, the uh, uh, idea that our microbiomes, the microbes, um, the you know, bacteria and other microorganisms that live in us and on us, 
have profound effects on our health and our well-being. And those have absolutely and irrevocably changed over the last even few hundred years, let alone the last several thousand. So I think we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg there in terms of how our internal flora and fauna affect things like obesity or, um, you know, various other aspects of our physiology and health. Yeah, yeah. Well, Marlene, thanks so much for being part of the show. It it was really interesting to hear your perspective, and thanks so much for coming on today. Thanks a lot for having me. You've been listening to another episode of Paleo Runner Podcast. For more information, go to paleorunner.org. Thanks for listening.